Hey everybody, John Fenn here, Church Without Walls International, C-W-O-W-I.org. We are a house church network. We celebrate the gathering of the saints by meeting in homes. Our meetings look nothing like they, like an auditorium meeting look. We follow the pattern of Acts 2.42, where they were constantly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, food, and prayer. It's very simple, but it's more like a lifestyle and a community of faith that's healthy and balanced it's the way they did it for the first 300 years uh, after Pentecost that saturated the Roman Empire in under 300 years. So visit our website, cwowi.org. There's 10 question and answer videos about house church. My book, Return to the First Church, is my journey to house church. There's uh, lots of other articles. Sign up for my weekly thoughts as well and my monthly newsletter. That's where we put word of our meetings, our conferences, our online meetings, uh, things of that nature, plus prophetic things in the newsletter. So uh, anyway, sign up for that, cwowi.org. Today, asking the question, what about the handicapped people? What about uh, healing for them or heaven? Or do they automatically go, etc.? What's the Lord's perspective on that? Many people don't realize that our oldest son, Chris, was born with the umbilical cord around his neck in a slip knot. And as a result, he was a blue baby when he was born by emergency C-section. He uh, re was revived, but he has brain damage called cerebral palsy. CP or cerebral palsy is any damage incurred to the brain during labor or delivery. It's not a disease, it's an injury. And as a result, there's different stages of it. Just a few seconds without oxygen here or there could mean the difference between somebody walking or not walking. Uh, for Chris, he is mentally in the four-year-old range, although he takes things in at a much higher rate. He is in a wheelchair. He had a stroke when he was 17 years old, so he's only got the use of his right hand. He can stand when I pull him up to pivot out of his wheelchair onto a toilet or bed or chair or something like that, uh, but he can't walk any longer. So he's in a wheelchair. He is the happiest little four-year-old you've ever seen in a man's body, in a 43-year-old man's body. Uh, he's nonstop commentary on every car, truck, person we meet in the stores, etc. He was at home for the first 24 years of his life. And then uh, when his little brothers uh, graduated school, went off to college, we realized how much help they had been and that we needed to make a move to put him in a group home. So as of this recording, he's been in that group home 19 years. Hardest decision we ever made in our lives. I want to share a little bit about it. I want to share a little bit about uh, another gentleman um, that I know uh, who's what the world would call handicapped and the Lord's perspective. The first thing is I'll say this. Yes, we know why it happened. Yes, he's had prayer and everything else. Uh, so no need to write me, email me or anything else at this stage of our lives. Uh, we've had all the answers we've, we've got and you've got to understand Chris's perspective. When Chris was 21, just to share this before I get into it, when Chris was 21, he came crawling down the hallway and uh, army man style, because he could just, he has to pull himself with his arms. And he, he came crawling down the hallway going, dad, dad, know what Jesus said to me? He said, he's going to walk through the mountains with me. Yep, that's what he said. One day he's going to walk through the mountains with me. Isn't that great? That's what he said. All right. He's going to walk through the mountains with me. And he was just excited and laughing and giggling at that. So since he's been about 21 years old, he, his faith has been set on, on heaven. Uh, he'll see kids running on TV, on a TV show or something, and, and he has said before, when I get to heaven, I'm going to run like that. And other such comments like that. And the Lord is very gracious to him, very good to him, <laughs> in, in ways that you can't even imagine the timing in our lives. Uh, I pick him up on Friday mornings, usually when I'm not traveling. We run, the day, we run errands all day long. All the store clerks know us. Um, if Barb and I happen to go into a store without him, uh, during the weekday or something like that, they'll ask where our little buddy is. Uh, Chris loves dogs, people, everything else. He's, he's just funny. He makes people laugh. Um, and as I said, yes, we know what happened. We know why it happened, etc. And so Chris's faith is set for heaven, even though every night, every Friday night when he's home, as I turn out the light, I say, buy a stripes and Chris will finish it. I was healed. But mentally, he doesn't have that ability to understand time and space and the whole concept of something done in the past that can benefit him now. So having said all that, now let me share a couple things. Uh, when we made that decision to put him in the group home, uh, Barb and I were up late crying, praying, asking the father, you know, just take him home. You know, I've been to heaven, Barb has been to heaven briefly, 
And, and, and we told him, we said, we'd rather go through even 50 years on this earth missing our, our oldest son, uh, but knowing he was in heaven, uh, than to have him go to a group home and, and live longer in that handicapped body of his. And uh, Barb eventually drifted off to sleep, and my eye was still going. I was saying, Father, just take him home to heaven. Or, or put his the brain damage on me. I know how to be healed. Put it on me, and I'll be healed. And at the same time, rebuking myself, because it's like, no, Jesus took that on himself. But why he's not healed, and Chris's will, and how that all mixes, you know, is still, like, out there, un unanswered. Um, you know, I've had, I've had visitations. I'll interrupt myself. I had, uh, obviously, most of the visitations early on, uh, we're there in our house with Chris just down the hallway asleep. And there's the Lord in the living room talking to me about things and teaching me things. I had one visitation where the where Chris is on my right side in his wheelchair during a Christian concert. And the Lord came up and started teaching me on my, and he was standing, the Lord on my left side with Chris on my right in the wheelchair, me seated, seated in a chair and the Lord Jesus standing there in my on my left side teaching me about how difficult it is for people who have chronic conditions or long-term conditions to be healed and why that is and gave me a big long teaching on why it was so difficult and Chris is right there I just want to take his hand and say just touch my son but when you're in the spirit that things like that don't don't happen it occurred to me yes but it, it just wasn't there to do that and anyway so back to that that night uh, before we put him in the group home I mean how do you tell a four-year-old he can't live at home anymore he's got to live a couple hours away it's, it's just it was horrible and so we said all that about taking him to heaven and, and everything. And suddenly the Lord was standing there uh, at the near the foot of the bed. And he just looked at me and he said, would you have Chris miss out on the fullness of his rewards by me taking him home early, bringing him home early, just because you feel bad for having to put him in a group home? And I went, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I never mentally, I always thought he had reward with Barb when I go off in ministry and they're partakers of the ministry and, and partners and, and everything else with me. But I hadn't realized it to this moment. So no, I don't want him to miss out on the fullness of his reward uh, by going home early. I, I, I value the, the reward that he would have. However, with these conditions, uh, I don't want him to suffer sexual abuse or, or be neglected. And with a single nod, downward nod of his head, he went, done, and then was gone. So Chris has been in that group home nearly 19 years, uh, nearly going on our 20th year now. Um, there's another man, I'll, I'll share this with you, um, a man named Will, uh, uh, deaf, and as well as deaf, not able to speak. And he was a part of the church uh, that I was on staff with uh, years ago. And he would always go forth to every single altar call, you know, and he didn't, he, whether he didn't have the understanding or he just loved the Lord, I don't know. He was always front and center, you know, down front, close uh, in every service. He truly loved the Lord, but he didn't have the understanding being deaf and uh, unable to speak. So if the pastor was calling for, you know, uh, somebody to be delivered from drug addiction, you want help with drug addiction and everything, come down front, their will came down front. If it was for women having trouble conceiving babies and you want to come down front for, for, for prayer, you know, and there's will right down front. <laughs> so the pastor finally told, asked me, he said, can you communicate? You seem to have a rapport with him. Can you somehow communicate that he doesn't have to go down front for every single altar call that we know his heart and the Lord knows his heart. So I was not successful in that. But he, he would always search me out, and I would always greet him and, and everything else. And maybe he had seen us with Chris, so I think he could relate. But one Sunday morning, I, uh, um, I was, suddenly I was in the Spirit, and I saw this during the worship. I saw the shaft of light coming down over Will. And I saw the Father's words going down the shaft of light, talking about how much he loves him. And, and, how he, and he, said, he said, in the ages to come, you'll be a teacher of many. For many will sit at your feet and learn of you. And I just saw these words coming down this shaft of light. And he's there with his hands upraised and he's just worshiping the Lord. And I thought, what a, what, wow, what a situation. He's deaf and he can't talk. And the Father's pouring this into him. And he's just like going crazy, just so excited in the things of the Lord. And it's like, I know he's receiving that. You know, that in the ages to come, he's going to be a teacher of many. And many are going to sit at his feet and learn of him. And I'm sitting there seeing this and, and, and watching this. I said, Father, why don't you heal him? And the father said, "Well, I enjoy his worship." I said, "Yeah, but look at look at the things that he's missing. Look at look at life and and marriage and kids and all the things that he could he could have." And he, and he just right like that said, "He finds his fulfillment in me." 
I said, but think of the vacations and, and money and cars and everything like that that he could he could ever want. And he said, I see to it. He has uh, all his needs are met. And I said, Father, what a wonderful thing it would be if a deaf mute got healed. Can you imagine the the ramifications in this church and even in the community? Because it's such such a miracle. And the father said this. He said, he said, no one greets him when he comes in and when he leaves. Or he said, few greet him, hardly anyone, greets him when he comes in or when he leaves. So I have set them in their I've set him in their midst as an example to them and a testimony against them on that last day. I was I was like in wow at that time. I, I was just in wow. I was like, wow. He is an example. He and you can be sure after that that I made sure to acknowledge him whenever I ran across him, because that that awareness uh, that the father didn't doesn't have to explain himself to me, doesn't have to explain himself about why Will wasn't healed or why the why he hasn't healed Chris. Uh, I mean, I know Chris's faith is for heaven. He's not looking for healing in particular. Mom and Dad are, but he's Chris is an adult and he understands the concept. But with with Will with that man, um, it was just such a such a, a moment that that was larger than just that moment. I have set him in their midst as an example to them and a testimony against them on that last day for no one greets him when he comes in or says goodbye to him when he leaves. That awareness of handicapped people, of the injured, of the infirmed, and we wonder sometimes why aren't they healed? I don't have all the answers. I don't know for my own son completely all the answers. I know where his faith is and I, and cannot go against that. Uh, the examples in the Gospels are of little children still within the authority of their parents, but Chris knows full and well about heaven and the Lord talking to him and stuff like that. So it's a little different. So I don't have all the answers, but I do know that when I see someone who is infirmed, um, children or adults, young or old, it doesn't matter, I look at them as the Lord giving me an opportunity to walk in love and to make allowances and to be blessed uh, in the grace that's in their lives. Uh, I remember in, in Luke 16, verses 19 through 31, it's a story of a beggar named Lazarus and a rich man, and they both die. And uh, the, the man in hell looks over to Abraham's bosom or paradise or captivity, as it was called back then, uh, where the righteous dead went before their sins were paid for. And he saw Abraham and he saw Lazarus. And Abraham made the statement to him, he says, in this life, Lazarus received only hardship and difficulty, so isn't it right he be comforted? And and I look at that and I see examples of the infirmed and, and the handicapped and different things through injury or through through birth or whatever, it doesn't matter. And I see that as an opportunity to walk in love. We've had friends say, I'm very uncomfortable with Chris. That, that makes me uncomfortable. For me, it's like I want to get out of my comfort zone. I want to walk in love. I want to push myself to walk in love. And the other thing is, that, he, that the, goes back to the reward. I don't understand all it is why the Lord would say, do you want Chris to miss out on the fullness of his reward by me bringing him home early? I don't know what reward he, he has, except at the group home, he is a blessing to people. As, as much of a burden as he is in our lives, in the natural, he is a blessing to people. He has been known to grab somebody's hand there at the group home and say, it's okay, Jesus is with us, don't be afraid. And it'll be okay. Jesus is with us. So, you know, he's got his reward on that level. So anyway, I don't have all the answers, but I hope this has brought some insight, perhaps, in terms of, of the Lord's perspective, that he doesn't view death like we do. He doesn't view infirmity like we do, uh, because so because the innocence of ch childhood, the innocence uh, mentally and everything uh, helps them <laughs> as far as their place in heaven. And they will once free of their infirm bodies, certainly be able to make a choice, just like every baby, every child who goes to heaven uh, will grow up and, and make the choice, the same choices that Adam and Eve had to make. But for now, uh, the Lord honors that and and looks at things a little differently than we do. So anyway, not to ramble on, but just to, to maybe look at things a little bit differently. And maybe in your church, is there someone who has an infirmity or is frail or weak and and perhaps they are set in your midst as an example, but don't let them be a testimony against you on that last day. Honor, respect, walk in love, and help. Um, and anyway, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I'm just sharing a little transparently about my life and, and our lives. And um, 
it's, it's been a long haul, but uh, it's been a blessing. All right, God bless.